so I'm here to talk about natural history collections, in particular bird collections. There's actually a handful of university-based repositories that have natural history collections in the Philippines. Of course, apart from our national repository, which is the National Museum of the Philippines, which actually you know, has separated it into its units. So the one uh, we now have a National Museum of Natural History under the yeah. Museum of the Philippines system. Of course, well, one of them is uh, University of the Philippines of Dubai, uh, Ateneo de Manila University, University of Tomas, which has the oldest collection. Actually, it's one of our first. Uh, it, it was so early on that it, the name is still in Spanish. Um, and of course, the one feature here is uh, the National uh, the Natural Science Museum of Silliman University in the Visayas. Of course, there are several other universities which have natural history collections. The Asal, Isabel State, Visayas State University, University of San Carlos in Talamban, Cebu. Um, and then our state university has three. There's the one in Tawita is a science, a marine science museum. Um, and then the one in Idigan, as well as, of course, the Aga Khan Museum featured here uh, in MSU Marawi. Actually, I, I was able to visit there and you have some of the collections that you won't find anywhere else in the Philippines. Of course, there's some outside the Philippines, but for example, the Sulu Hornbill, which of course is from Tawi Tawi, the only known specimen is in Aga Khan Museum. So we don't have it, National Museum doesn't have it. So if it's just to see the specimen, you have to go all the way to Marawi. But we are fortunate to have some of these, um, uh, one of the largest collections of uh, vertebrates in the Philippines. Um, so the UBL, I'm mean from the UBL Museum of Natural History, so we hold a lot of biological specimens. We have about 750,000 specimens. Of course, a large portion of those would be arthropods, which is about one in six, almost five to 600,000 specimens. Um, part of that collection we now call the Heritage Collection. A lot of those specimens were collected even early on. Our oldest, I think, is 1862. Um, it's quite surprising because a lot of the collections here in campus were destroyed during the war. Um, some of the herbarium specimens were used for fuel. So it had cold nights. So, um, so we had, some of them had survived. Uh, some were recollected in the 60s and 70s, including the renowned collection of the late Dr. Bius Flores from which you now recognize as the father of Philippine white life. So again, this is one of the collections that was left to us. Actually, there's three major collections in the Philippines. Sidiman University has a third. MSU Marawi in Agahan Museum has another. And the one because um, Dr. Abrachi moved around these three universities, he finally settled here and of course died here in Los Manos. So that he has left uh, a large proportion of those Philippine land vertebrates. So they're basically birds and mammals. There's a few reptiles and amphibians. So he's more renowned for collecting um, birds and mammals. Um, if you look at it, oh, by the way, that's a picture of Dr. Um during his field work days. He was so into zoology, he named most of his daughters after animals. So yes, one was named Electro Electris, Ardea Ardeola, Victorina Juliet. Ardea Ardeola is actually translated to the genus Heron and Pan Heron. So yeah, if you are into your particular taxon group, you can start naming your children after your group. So I'm um, not going to the actual species in the Philippines of 700 species, about 700 species of birds now because of the many splits and new discoveries. I'm going to go back to the old checklist, the old checklist number 16, uh, published in 1991 by Dickinson. So a comparison of the orders and families, our collection at the moment, uh, which is a third of the actual report collection left in the Philippines, a large portion of the collection is outside the Philippines. Most, the largest, of course, is in the Field Museum, in Yale University and, of course, in the American Museum of Natural History. 88% um, of the families represented in the Philippines, the Asian families, are here in our collection. And of the total species, about 233, or 42%. So minus a really nice coverage. A lot of these specimens also, I think, are important because they can no longer be collected in the wild. For example, we have specimens of uh, the woolly neck stork, and the anhinga, most of which are very hard to find in the wild or no longer seen in the wild for the past few years. 
of course, from the entire collection that we were collected, um, about 69 species and subspecies have been described of vertebrates, mostly birds, of course, together with either most of the museums where he collaborated, such as with Dr. Ripley uh, and Rothfield Brand, American Museum and Enfield Museum. Um, there's still a few species that were discovered, even when the board died, when he left the collection to, to us at the museum, there were two or three other specimens that were still uncovered, including the was named after his wife, uh, Lina, so it was called Lina Sunburn, that was described even after uh, the Andrew Grace collection. Among the species that was named after Dr. Rabor, this is Napotera Raborai. Um, so this is one of the species that was significantly uh, contributed by Rabor, and it was named after him. So he didn't describe it. You can't describe the species and name it after yourself, Baba Buyong. You can have to you have to wait for somebody to name it after you. So you have to make friends with taxonomists. Ah, oh, I named this one after me. Or if you discovered that you should name it after you. Um, so there were five species and four subspecies of uh, vertebrates that were named after Dr. Rapport, including this one. Although phylogenetic changes have changed the genus uh, to Robsonius Rapport. So in my focus, we in our out of our eight collections in, in the Museum of Natural History, we have the entomological collection, the botanical herbarium, the mycological collection, including the microbial culture collection. Uh, my favorite, of course, because I work on birds. I'm an ornithologist. I work with the ES Robor Wildlife Collection, which is part of the Zoological and Wildlife Museum. So we think that often people think of these study skins that are pressed into these cabinets as dusty collections. They are dusty. Mind you. So if you have rhinitis, you know, Rachel Mahira, so you have to wear a mask when you, and when you hold them. But they are still of very significant value as a buyer resource. resource. Actually, if you put together all the collections of Dr. Rabor, he has collected more than 60,000 specimens for over his entire career. Large, a large number of those collections are, of course, abroad. Uh, the Field Museum, uh, the Delaware Museum of Natural History, the Yale Peabody Museum, the U.S. National Museum, uh, MNH. Uh, natural, there's a few specimens exchanged with the National History Museum, this is formerly the British Museum. Um, and of course, for us, we have about 10,000 specimens of birds and about 5,000 specimens of mammals. So 15,000 is in the collection here at the University of Philadelphia, East Los Banos, which I think is the second could say second largest collection um, of, of birds and mammals in the Philippines. So I have to say second, I say National Museum would always be the first. Of course, a lot of these uh, specimens are important for visiting researchers. So, but I think the, the significance is still because they were brought here not as a research collection per se, it's actually a teaching collection. The Museum of Natural History is actually a, a, um, a compilation of different teaching collections from the different units. So most of them are still actually housed in the old units. So actually, one fourth of the entire biological sciences building is in the museum because four of the collections are there: the herbarium, uh, the mycological herbarium, the entomological collection, and of course the DS for wildlife collection. So we still use the for teaching, especially in taxonomy, ornithology, mammalogy, and ecology. Quite happy in my students, but I'll do a picture. Another thing is to highlight the importance of wildlife species that was collected in the past. It would be important records of uh, distribution from the past, but also because it could also be used for teaching, especially for training um, different units, uh, particularly from the DNR, or Department of Environment and Natural Resources. We use the specimens for uh, teaching them how to identify specimens uh, for those which are illegally traded. Also, the, the basis of the distribution records can tell where and when they were they used to be from, and has been the basis for uh, analyzing um, changes in their distribution, especially for endangered species. So this is one of the pictures with Dr. Dalai Perry Ong when he had the, he chaired the Philippine Red List Committee under the DNR. So a lot of uh, our staff were actually part of that group. So um, 
as a teaching tool, we have used the specimens. I mean, even for myself, I used it in my own uh, dissertation. Uh, we actually applied this standard criteria for species delimitation. As Ian pointed out, there's a lot of uh, splits, a lot of cryptic species. So we need to use a standard methodology to kind of compare subspecies and populations, whether they are truly split species or not. So because the Philippines has so many islands, a lot of differences in populations between uh, highland and lowland, so we need to address these issues of species delimitation. So we use the standard criteria, which is applied by the British Ornithologists Union, published in 2010 by uh, Dr. Tobias, which is the supervisor. Um, so he's used it for, for a lot of the European species, but then we then applied it for our different groups here in the Philippines, including the ones I'm studying, which are hornbills. So this is the one which I use just to show you how the method works. So there are morphological bases, both plumage, morphometrics, whether they vary. It's always a pairwise com comparison, two separate uh, populations being compared. So this is the score for morphology and plumage. And since the, it's a scoring system, um, so the, the total score for that particular pair between hydrocorax and mindanensis is nine. The threshold value is seven. So it passes the threshold value. So they are indeed separate species. So they were recognized as subspecies before, now you can elevate the two, two separate subspecies. We compare Hydrocorax and Semigaliatos, the other subspecies, uh, also passes a score of nine. However, between Mindanensis and Semigaliatos, which are closely related species in the south, only difference is actually the, the, the large cast, the other one has a smaller cast, I'll show you the picture on the next slide, um, it didn't pass the threshold. And to show you that comparison, that is hydrocorax with a full red bill. This is Mindanensis and Tendigaliatus. They're actually situated very close to each other in Greater Mindanao. So they are still considered as one species, but separate subspecies. So the only split is between this species here and the other two. However, if you look at it using some mitochondrial cytochrome B, they do pass the threshold of four for genetic divergence. So they're about a uh, value of, go back, they are, uh, it's 8.5, 11.5, and 8.2, which are beyond the, uh, the threshold of four. So genetically, they could be considered as three species, but we're following the criteria about Jesus morphology, so they pass only for two species. Okay, so we did the same thing, uh, looking into some of the other common, uh, unusual subspecies. This is uh, the olive back sunbird, so many subspecies around the Philippines. Some of them have this orange breast, others just have a yellow breast. So James, actually uh, one of our staff at the museum, passed away last December. He did this study way back in 2014 when he was still a student. And looking into pairwise comparison, as you know, the threshold should be seven. This is six, six and four. None of them pass the threshold. And that means they're not separable as species, so they're still retained as subspecies. But so yeah, a lot of subspecies are important. This is Chris Pantua. She did studies on the trogon, uh, the purple throated sunbird, and the buzzy flower pecker. Uh, for the trogons, a beautiful species. We always wish we had more trogons in the Philippines because Borneo has seven. So here in the Philippines have one, sorry you couldn't split them up, they're still one species. But for the purple for the sunbird, that can actually see the biggest difference, that one's red and one's yellow. So that actually passed uh, the, the value of seven. I'll show you the, the scores a bit later. But for, for the buzzy flower pecker, yes, they're not that different, but there's enough morphological and plumage differences to pass the score of seven. So they are now a northern and southern population. This is the scoring system we did for uh, the purple throated sunbird, particularly the subspecies Julie, which is actually the name of Dr. Rapport's daughter, Dr. Nectarina Julie Felizar, who has given probably, uh, she's a gynecologist, she's actually given the help uh, provide birds for a lot of people here in Los Banos. That's her doctor. So again, 
two different species, red and yellow. There used to be one species now. They could split up to two separate species. Now next Jardinia, well, Leptocoma Jardinia. Passing the score of eight. And second to last, you have uh, on Philippine nut hatches and elegant tit mice. Call it elegant tit, but there's two. It's a little hard to say, so tit mice is better. So this is the elegant tit. Uh, not able to separate and set not enough data to split them up into a separate species, but Yasmin, who's now a medical doctor, um, was able to find a possible new subspecies for her comparison. So she still has to come back from her medical career and describe that new subspecies. Um, yes, she was able to split up these two subspecies, now elevated to full species, known as the uh, development fronted and the sulfur bill uh, net hatch. Then you have uh, Mesa Velosa, who looked into barbets. There's only one species of barbet in the Philippines. There's several subspecies. You can see the difference in the face coloration, the red face and the, and the yellow red face. Um, no, she wasn't able to separate any species between subspecies, but she was able to clump or cluster together the red face and the yellow face. And they do seem to appear into two separate groups and might represent a separate species. Uh, Ms. Ugai was looked into, actually there's a previous study that looked into its phylogeny and they tried separating these using cytochrome B. So she just provided the morphological data. So she went back to the specimens and looked at it and yes, does confirm the splits made by that phylogenetic study. Uh, especially for the Visayan fantail, the blue-headed fantail, between the blue-headed fantail and the Visayan blue fantail from that of the Mindanao blue fantail. So all of them are now elevated to full species, which increases the number of species of birds in the Philippines. So if you're a bird watcher, you've been to the Philippines, oh, I've seen that. Oh, they're now split. Oh, I have to go back and see it again. Good for tourism. Um, Stephen Fortella uh, looked into Malcojas. These are beautiful cuckoos from the Philippines. Um, as you can see, there's a basic difference from uh, the um, uh, Supernosis and Cambianensis. So there used to be one species. Now he was able to split them up into two species. And he wants to do the phylogeny next. So he's now taking his master's in genetics. So aside from those um, specimens that you look at them in terms of morphology, well, look at them closely, they actually harbor a lot of other things. Even though they've been collected 20, 30 years ago, they still have lice attached to them. Even though they've been dried for a long time and kept in drawers, there's still parasites attached to those feathers. So that would be an interesting way to look into um, host parasite relationships for as long as you prevent any cross contamination and mishandling specimens. So it has to be kept. Each of the different taxa should be in their distinct rows. So not thinking of putting them in plastic bags, but it's not going to be easy. As long as you maintain separate, so you make sure that there is no cross contamination. So Miss Fabricas was able to look into feather lines in these museum skits, skins, both here at the Museum of Natural History of the Los Banos, and also specimens from the Philippine National Museum. So here's an example of those uh, feather lights from. Malafaga. We actually followed a paper that was the methodology by Erdel, who was in the 60s and 70s, and found three genera, the Musero nirmus, Musero fagus, and Shapina. Mind you, all these genera are found only in hornbills. So these are feather lice. The genus is uh, host-specific to hornbills. So she was able to find a lot of specimens from that in both the, the MNH and in the National Museum. There's actually some species which are actually more. So this is for Shabinia. And this is for Seronirmus. Notice there's a lot more, 247. A lot more from the National Museum. I think it's because of the practices. Uh, some of them we kind of clean. Uh, the specimens with a brush to remove the dust, so probably had affected the amount of attachment of these ectoparasites. And this is Vasenophagus, not much uh, 
They're very quite rare in the collection, but they are a new sub, uh, new genus uh, that was discovered for the Philippines. So yes, there's a lot of new discoveries by just going through the dead specimens, if you have the time. And lastly, you have uh, the use of specimens as a source of DNA. So we were able to do this uh, as historical DNA because most of the formulas are difficult to catch in the wild. So getting contemporary samples is quite difficult because they are cannabis species. I've been in Shadow Madre catching hornbills for six months. I only caught two species and six individuals. So not very cost effective. So we use the specimens as a source of DNA. The problem is they're of course very much degraded. Uh, the older they are, the more degraded they are, but also the tropical, the samples taken from tropical areas are not well cared for, so they degrade further. Um, so even like this one, a uh, specimen that was collected by Wallace, um, the DNA there is actually better from better condition from the DNA we got here in Los Banos. So this is the one I use for my part of my one of my chapters for my dissertation on hornbills, uh, comparing the both phenotypic and the molecular divergence. I uh, use mitochondrial uh, mitochondrial DNA, cytochrome B uh, for hornbills is more uh, useful in terms of comparison. And this is my full tree with about 350 uh, samples. Which actually presented in the last ANRRC. So today, museums are taking a big step in ensuring that these collections can be of further significance for other studies, especially with a lot of new techniques being used, uh, whether it's for um, phylogeny or for um, studying ectoparasites, or even just reviewing the, the actual um, status of their taxonomy in terms of subspecies and species mm -hmm. limitations. We also need to up hold the standards between natural history museums, collections, especially the bird collections. A lot of them are just kept in growers, no air conditioning, so there's a lot of degradation that occurs, or there's a lot of contamination that may occur, so we need to upgrade that. Some, of course, there was a talk about ISO yesterday, so maybe there would become that we need to do um, standards uh, for these collections. And with that, I am thankful for your attention. Of course, I'd like to thank the NRC and uh, our sponsors for making this event uh, possible. If you haven't been, oh, you have the tour of the museum. Our main slogan at the museum is to bring nature close to the people and bring uh, people closer to nature. But also, because of the white um, coverage, uh, we also cover from microbes to mammals. So if you have any questions about the museum, uh, please do visit our website. Thank you.